I'm Sarah Thornton. I'm the Chief Constable of Thames Valley Police. And in your role as Chief Constable as of, of Thames Valley Police, what do you most enjoy? I think it's the same uh, at this level as when I started. It's the infinite variety of policing. You know, if you speak to a constable, they'll say, you don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. Uh, and at my level, maybe there's a bit more predictability because there's more meetings. You know, any large organisation, there's always meetings. But it's just the variety. I, I was thinking you know, uh, on the way down here, yesterday, I in the afternoon, I met with the Home Secretary with two other Chief Constable colleagues. I went from that to see some of our cadet units in Slough and Windsor, so young people um, doing all sorts of uh, exciting things, um, wanting and to find out more about policing in, in our cadet schemes. And, and then today I've been in formal meetings with my Police and Crime Commissioner, um, talking to him about what we've been doing to tackle rural crime, organised crime, what's happening in terms of crime figures, whether they're going up or down. And then this afternoon doing some radio interviews for our Force Open Day, which is tomorrow and I'll be there. I think the biggest challenge when you're leading an organisation is the buck stops here. Um, and therefore that sense of vicarious liability, that sense of responsibility. And I, I lead a very large organisation. There's 9,000 staff, budget of £400 million, pounds, um, dealing with risk on a daily basis. So lots of things can go wrong. And we're dealing with pretty serious issues, um, sometimes matters of life and death. So the hardest thing, I think, is that sense of responsibility. Uh, and you're never really off duty. Um, maybe sometimes when I'm on holiday, I try to forget about the job, but I do have a, a very kind of uh, visceral sense of responsibility for the organisation. I, I think the other thing that's hard, and it's like that, I guess, in many big jobs, it's the people issues. You know, sometimes I'm called upon to dismiss staff. Um, making decisions about budget cuts, knowing that some people are going to be made redundant, not voluntarily, but compulsory. You know, that is difficult. Um, you know, dealing with difficult cases where, um, you know, situations um, are, are tricky, feelings are very high on both sides, and, and how do you um, act justly, act empathetically? So... Um, the main thing is that sense of responsibility for what is a pretty risky business and not being able to get away from that. that that's fine. That's the deal. Um, but, but the second thing, which is, I think, in common with many leaders, is that those, those difficult, difficult people issues. It's about do you do the right thing or do you do the easy thing? The police deals with a lot of crises, um, you know, everything from kind of terrorist incidents to you know, high-risk missing children, kidnaps, so, you know, that's an aspect in our work that maybe other jobs don't have. And in terms of the leadership that's required, I would say that it's, it's very similar, but it's that intensity, it's the tempo that's different. So all the things that you should be doing um, around decision making, for example, in terms of you know, consulting the experts, gathering the information, being clear about what decisions you're making, making sure those decisions are communicating, checking up that it's, that it's happening on the ground, all those things that you would normally do, but you're doing them at speed, with an intensity, and maybe with much kind of greater risk. If you make the wrong call, then actually the stakes could be higher. So I, I don't think it's necessarily a different skill set. I think it's the same skill set, but with a, in a massively different tempo, in that intense situation. And, I, you know... It, and say, you know, particularly where around firearms officers, um, those high risk situations, firearms officers have drills. Firearms commanders, you don't exactly have a drill, but you have a decision making model. You have a kind of a theory about how you make decisions. And, you know, when you're under pressure, um, when the stakes are high, then you need to make sure you understand those things and they're there and they become automatic. That's the way to deal with it. In my own force, I'm the chief. And so uh, I lead a team of, of eight other people, but it's quite apparent I'm the leader. So I have a positional power. Um, of course, I would always seek to influence as well, but, but actually it's, it's quite clear. You know, I have a badge of rank on my shoulder and ev everybody knows. 
But I do work an awful lot with other chief constables where I don't have that hierarchical position, except to say that we have an association of chief police officers, which is known as ACPO, uh, and I am one of the vice presidents. So I have been elected by my colleagues, but that's quite a flimsy form of authority. You know, two years ago, you know, um, I was a popular choice. Um, so I am working with colleagues, um, and indeed the president, who, who is more senior than me, um, trying to influence. Um, and, and what would I say? If you're working with peers, relationships are so important. You know, just those conversations, those text messages, forming relationships, trying to see things from the other person's perspective. You know, I might have a position, they might have a position. Well, why is it that they're thinking differently from me? Do I really care about my position? Can I give? Can I look at it from their perspective? You know, the sort of things are you know, walking in somebody else's shoes, all that kind of stuff. So. Um, relationships, empathy, a bit of humility, I guess, in your leadership. Um, and, and, you know, trying to, to, to achieve, um, mediate some sort of common aim. I, I'm, you know, a great one. I, one of the examples I, I might give uh, later today is a recent example, working with chiefs. You know, when I, we were making a decision which I knew was controversial, so what do I do? Get on the phone. Get on the phone to the four or five people who are going to be most concerned about it and just say, look, this is why we're thinking of doing this. What do you think? Or, or just text them. This is what we're doing. Is it OK? So I think that personal contact that shows you value their views, um, I think really does kind of help to bring the team along. I think sometimes from outside the police service, people can think there's a sort of stereotypical police chief constable. Um, that's not been my experience uh, and I would hope um, if people met chiefs they would see the difference because one of the most important things as we develop in organisations as leaders that we do it our way that we don't think there's some sort of clone that there's a company person you've got to be that actually we all bring our different strengths and weaknesses uh, our different personalities our different characters uh, and that kind of diversity brings a richness. The last thing we want is, is, is all the same sort of people. And so in terms of my own approach, um, I sometimes say that I, I want to be seen as the, the good king. And, and what do I mean by that? Um, there's an element of leading, which is the king bit, which is the exercise of authority. And I'm in a serious business. Uh, and we are, you know, in the business of protecting the public. And that's serious. And if that goes wrong, then the consequences can be quite devastating for people. So there needs to be a toughness, and I think I have a reputation. Somebody said to me the other day that my staff had told them that I was a hard taskmaster. And I thought about that. I said, I don't mind that because a bit of discipline, that this matters, is important. But I also want to be a good king. I want to be empathetic to people. I want to be reasonable. I want to listen. I want to show um, humility in my leadership and I want to show concern of the individuals. So that sense of, uh, of a, a warmth about the relationship with staff, I think is really important. So I, I would hope throughout my career, um, I had a kind of developed sort of leadership style, which was consistent, but most importantly, that, that's mine and that it's not copied elsewhere. I mean, the classic, you know, when people are, are seeking promotion, there is a view if you want to be a chief officer, you know, you've got to say this or you've got to do that. No, you haven't. You know? And you lead from the front, don't you, in so far as if you ring Thames Valley Police, it's your voice immediately that a member of the public hears. One of the things that uh, one of my colleagues, a sergeant, suggested three or four years ago was that the um, uh, voice on the end of the phone when people ring the police um, should be mine. Uh, and so we've made a few recordings over the years because the message has changed. And by and large, the uh, feedback has been really, really good about that. Um, the only thing sometimes is um, that uh, people then want to speak to me personally, which, of course, I can't possibly do because I've got other things to do. But the question, do you lead from the front? Sometimes, always, never. Well, the answer has got to be sometimes. Because, of course, sometimes it's absolutely right to lead, lead from the front. But I quite like the idea of leading from the middle particularly 
in the situation I am in now, I have a, a team uh, of eight really fantastic, capable people. I have either selected or had a very strong hand in the selection of all of them. And, you know, I need to give them room to be the really brilliant people they are. So, you know, creating, I don't know, the, the vision, you know, what are we going to achieve? What is, what's, the, um, what's the goal? And, and to give people the space and the confidence to deliver, I think, is really, really important. So sometimes that kind of leading from the middle is really uh, key. But, you know, in times of crisis, you know, up there at the front, when things are under pressure, um, one of the things um, that I've dealt with recently was a, a very, very difficult case um, of, of child grooming in Oxford. And the case was going through the court process. And we knew, because of what the press, what the journalists had been saying to us, that we were going to be criticised if we got convictions. We wanted to get convictions, and in fact, five nasty, dangerous, violent men were sentenced to life imprisonment. However, it was clear that the emerging narrative was going to be missed opportunities. And so, in terms of leading from the front, I had decided, in conjunction with some of my colleagues, that I would do the media on what we call day two. So not outside the court, because the investigating office will always do that, but on day two, when people are beginning to ask organisational questions. And that was really tough. That was really tough, because, you know, John Humphrey said, was I going to resign? Um, really difficult to deal with, both actually at the time, but reflecting on, well, have I done something wrong? You know, w what is my responsibility as a leader? And so that's an example I would say of leading from the front, but at some cost. It's a bit like going you know, over the parapet first and you've got your head shot off. Um, so I would argue leading from the front, sometimes, always, never. I think probably the answer is sometimes. Is there anything you say to us about being a woman chief constable in what is perceived to be a male environment? For the first hundred and odd years of policing, all police officers were men. Um, women police have been integrated for about the last 40 years. Um, and in my service, I've been a police officer for 27 years. The lot of women has changed enormously. It's not perfect. Uh, and of police officers, uh, most forces have got 30% or so of women officers. Um, clearly, at, with people with less service, the percentages are higher. Um, with that, some of it dates from when fewer women joined. Um, so it is a predominantly male organisation. It's a gendered organisation built around the needs of men, traditionally. Um, and so um, it is different. Um, it, being a woman, um, the concept of leadership, I think, is very often unless checked a male concept. You know, if you imagine a leader, you imagine a man, not a woman. So it, it is different and it has been hard. But I, I would say that it is changing really quite quickly. The number of women in senior roles uh, is increasing. Um, some of that's through you know, policies, deliberate positive action. Some of it is, you know, because women are pretty good at being police officers. You know, they make very good investigators. Um, you know, this idea of kind of a Sweeney and a very kind of male detective. Um, if you go into a lot of the uh, CID officers in police stations throughout the country, you'll find a lot of very capable women who work very, you know, methodically and carefully putting the evidence together. Interview, but they make women often make very good interviews. So um, it, it is changing. It, it, and I wouldn't say I wouldn't want to say it's perfect, um, but um, it, it has changed enormously. Now, at my level, being a woman, um, I, I think we're about of, of the forty-three chiefs in England and Wales. I think at the moment it's something like nine women. So it's not bad, um, and that's increased. You know, the last couple of years. Um, so we are a more notable kind of presence around, around the table when all the chiefs meet. And I would say, on the whole, um, the organisation is quite keen to make sure its leadership is more diverse. And so, um, you, you know, you get noticed, there's fewer of you. Um, on the whole, that's a good thing. You get included. Um, although, as I've always said, 
it's great to be noticed when you're doing well. By the way, your mistakes also get noticed. You're just much more visible and therefore sometimes more vulnerable. So um, you know, I am aware of my gender, um, but I would say at, at this level, um, you know, there are both advantages um, and, and some disbenefits, but, but not that many. I mean, I suspect some of the bad behaviour that's gone on in organisations maybe still goes on in pockets in my own organisation. But you'd have to be very brave to make a sexist remark to the chief. And most of my colleagues are not that brave or that stupid.